Now we're about to take a deep dive into the uranium sector, and I'd like to welcome up our moderator and our panelists. Uh, we've invited the founder of the Outsider Club, Nick Hodge, to moderate this discussion. And when it comes to uranium, Nick's as good as it gets. And his newsletter, The Outsider Club, has grown to at least over 400,000 subscribers, uh, which is absolutely remarkable. So Nick, come on up on stage, and Nick will be joined by Pure Point Uranium Group and ALX Uranium Corp. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jay, for having us. I just wanted to take a picture of the audience real quick, so that way when uranium's at $75, I can compare the standing room only versus what we have today, because it's coming. All the seats will be filled. Exactly, yeah. standing room. So as Jay said, we're gonna take a deep dive in uranium. At first, I'll let the two gentlemen to my left introduce themselves and their companies, and then I'll take a seat next to them and we'll talk more uh, macro uranium stuff. So behind the stage there, the gentlemen were arguing and president and CEO of Pure Point Uranium, Chris Frostad, said that he was older, so he gets to go first. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm Chris Frostad, president and CEO of Pure Point Uranium. We're a, a uranium exploration company working exclusively in northern Saskatchewan in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, we have 10 projects currently in that area. Uh, the one that we are spending most of our efforts on these days is called Hook Lake. It, is, uh, it sits on the Patterson Uranium District adjacent to Fission and NextGen. And we are all working through that same trend, um, in our case with our partners Cameco and Arriva. Uh, sorry, now Orano. That's a dollar. <laughs> and sitting next to him is Warren Stanier. He's the chairman and CEO of ALX Uranium. Hi, Warren Stanier, ALX Uranium Corp. Uh, my description of our company is going to be very much like Chris's because, like him, uh, we are explorationists and we are exclusively in the Athabasca Basin. We have projects located in the Northeast. We've now staked some new ground. There was a lot of ground that came open in the last few months, but also our flagship project, I would say, operated by Denison, is in the south part of the basin the Hook Carter project, which is directly on trend with his project. <laughs> Fortunately, all the good stuff stops at the claim line. So, yeah. <laughs> so we're neighbors. So I, I want to get back to your projects in the basin in a bit, but first I want to talk through the uranium industry. Uh, everybody wants to know the answer to the question when, right? We, we know that it's going to happen, that uranium supplies 10 to 20 percent of the world's electricity, but it's sort of been in a funk, or more than a funk, since Fukushima. So I gave a talk at the last Cambridge show back in January over at the other convention center, the west part of it there, and I tried to answer the question, is it uranium's time? And I said, yes, it's uranium's time. The time is now starting. The spot price is off the bottom a bit. And since then, we've seen some of the equities have quite frankly, uh, good buoyancy. We've seen some stocks perform quite well, and others haven't started to perform. I won't say they're underperforming, they just continue that trajectory that the uranium sector has been in. Why do you think some uranium companies are starting to, to, to perform or to get, to get traction? Well, personally, I don't think uh, we're actually seeing any traction yet. I think the biggest movement we saw was back in February when we saw a lot of the, the, larger, uh, the larger names took quite a hit, and I think that was primarily due to the Global X Uranium ETF rebalancing their fund. Uh, they moved from pretty much a pure uranium ETF to more of a nuclear uh, ETF, which meant they started to bring on new names, new uh, contractors, construction companies, whatnot in the industry, and by doing so, they, they relieved themselves of a lot of the uh, uranium, pure uranium plays. Uh, they, um, I think they've announced they were taking Cameco from something like 25% of the fund down to 21. Uh, we saw next gen go from, I think, 11 and a half down to seven and a half. Uh, uranium energy took a, a big hit as well. And in doing so, they released, okay, they found us. <laughs> in doing so, uh, there was, there was uh, a, a lot of sell-off in, in those names uh, that we saw. And what we're seeing now, I believe, is those big names really have come back up to where they were in January. So I, I think what we, we're not so much seeing uh, stocks taking off as we're seeing a recovery of what happened in February and March. Uh, and I think for the most part, all of us uh, have, you know, investors seem to have found a happy value for us right now over the last five, six, seven months 
uh, with very little movement. And I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of joy until we see uranium prices take an earnest move. I would say that it's very selective, that it's company by company. I mean, Cameco has reduced production. They're only producing 9 million pounds now, and they're buying 9 million to meet their 18 million that they need. Uh, and I also read that they're taking more from inventory, so they're holding inventory somewhere. Uh, because of their curtailed production, I would say that that's why they've gone from, I look at the U.S. price, like below $10 U.S. to about 11, up to 11.50 recently. So they consider that a nice move, and I think they're gratified that the cutbacks that they, they are making uh, has resulted in a higher share price. I mean, our companies as explorationists, uh, we're not moving because we're not producing and we're not curtailing mm -hmm. uh, production. So all of these uh, factors influence the share prices. Also in the US, I, I've just read that there's a petition has been made to the Department of Commerce by two US producers that they're looking at they want to have certain producers in Kazakhstan and Russia declared as, well, like market meddlers, that they're overproducing or they're being subsidized or whatever it is. They want American producers to gain some favor. Therefore, they will produce more themselves. So their shares have gone up. And I believe it's in reaction to that from January. So I was going to ask about the U.S. administration later, but that's a, that's a pretty good segue. Uh, where does, where does the, the politics pl play into all of this? The United States is something like 90% dependent on the uranium that they import. Um, you talk about the petition that UR Energy and Energy Fuels just submitted. Um, and then you have Trump as president who is you know, seemingly protectionist and, and wants to initiate or, or at least win trade wars. What kind of policies could, could help, or what kind of policies would you like to see that could help North American uranium? Well, I think, I think, um, I th I think the 232 petition you talk about is, is more pressure than it is reality at this point. And it does make sense uh, that, that there's a good chance that might even go through. But uh, you've, also got, you've also got Russia uh, mm -hmm. threatening sanctions against the U.S., so they're not going to deliver uranium to the U.S. sites anymore as well. All of these things are going to create upward pressure in, in uranium prices. Uh, you know, I think, I think it's just really going to come down to supply. You know, we, we've seen the cuts in the production. We've seen, uh, we see the, uh, to your point, we've seen uh, the chemicals of the world, and, and a lot of the other producers are soaking up inventory. They're buying on the spot to fulfill their contracts. Um, and at the end of the day, I think, I think Kazakhstan really holds the lever in terms of uranium prices mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So I think, I think a lot of the politics are, are somewhat noise. Uh, they're going to provide positive pressure for the, for the price for us. Uh, but, but the real things that are going to make, uh, make the price come back are the, uh, is, is, is the real supply. Well, let's talk mm -hmm. about supply in Kazakhstan then. They're um, slated to IPO their production on, uh, arm, Kazataprom, and uh, to do that, as I understand it, they've created a marketing arm that's going to take possession or buy their uranium and then market it and sell it just like a Western company would. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on that, the, the IPO of Kazataprom and how that impacts the uranium industry? I don't have any thoughts on it. I hope it doesn't go through. <laughs> No, well, the, the problem out of Kazakhstan was because of their, their transfer pricing laws, all of their product, for the most part, has been sold into the spot market, not, mm -hmm. not into the long-term contract. contract market, right. because their, their pricing has to, uh, has to be uh, uh, validated by, by a market price. And so all of that product that they've been producing and flooding the markets with is going into the spot. So where we would typically see the spot market making up 5 6 7% of, of the total uranium market, it's now grown to over 20%. Of the uh, of the total market, so by by setting up their their uh, marketing arm wherever they set it up at Switzerland or what have you, mm -hmm. uh, what what you should see is them starting to move their uranium through that marketing arm, and setting up proper long term contracts. It also gives them a, a tax break uh, out of Switzerland certainly by by getting the, the the sales up in that area as well. So I think it's going to allow them to certainly. Uh, cease doing what they've been doing, which is flooding the market, keeping the pro keeping the price down, and and I think now that that you know the likes of Cameco and whatnot have cried uncle, uh, you're going to see them turning the uh, pulling the lever and pulling this stuff back up, the price up. Nick, can can I just go back to the U.S. and mm -hmm. and you asked about, well, I think you're alluding to the Trump effect, and I think right. there is a real effect that the president of the United States can now make decisions on trade, and if there was some kind of a 
tariff put on exports from other countries of uranium that's going to spark U.S. production. So as far as how Canada benefits, I'm not sure, but I know for a fact the permitting in the United States is so streamlined compared to what it was right. in eight year, for eight years. And I just found that myself in Nevada and another company that we got a permit so quickly and we're, we're sustainable, we're not going to ruin the environment. This is not for uranium, but I'm just saying that for uranium producers, it's going to be easier or for explorers to look for uranium and therefore produce uranium and combined with tariffs that could really boost the North American industry. Canada, I'm not sure, but the U.S. for sure. Well, I mean, your neighbors, right? Rising tide is, is how I would look at it, a catalyst, right? If That would be a spark if, if they were to put, you know, uh, like you say, a tariff on, on uranium imports from another country. That's just a spark that helps the price of uranium go up that lifts all uranium ships, I would assume, right? So, you know, when I talk about the uranium market or when I see videos online or I, I read things about you know, analyst reports, uh, Haywood was just out yesterday saying it looks like a great time to buy uranium stocks. Certain things are always mentioned. We've, we've, covered, we've covered some of them, the production cuts, supply. Let's talk a little bit about the other things that we always hear about. Let's talk about Japan for a second. Um, I think the eighth reactor was just restarted or initiated to be restarted this week and they've got at least that many more to come back online. How do you guys, how do you guys view Japan? Is that, is that a critical part of the thing or is, or is the ascension of, of Chinese build-outs and Indian build-outs enough to supplant that? Um, I think, I, I think uh, Japan has turned into a bit of a red herring when it comes to signaling the return of uranium. Uh, certainly, uh, Japan shutting off 10% of the world's reactors uh, was, was, was the downfall to all of us, and it certainly caused the problem, but I don't think it's necessarily the correction of the problem. Um, by the end of last year, global nuclear power generation had exceeded what it was pre-Fukushima. So in fact, there'd been enough other reactors turned online over the last five, six, seven years to make up for what was lost in, uh, in Japan. I think and if there's you, now more reactors online than there were pre Absolutely, Absolutely, well. absolutely. And if you, if you project that forward and look at what's under construction today and how they'll be turned on, we are really in a, in a position on, a, on the demand side of seeing uh, global nuclear power uh, really hockey sticking up, and that is in the absence of any more reactors being turned on in Japan. Uh, certainly, it will be helpful when we see those things turn back on, uh, but it, it's, not, it's not the uh, bellwether that, that things are better. I think, it's, uh, I think people are a little overly focused on the Japanese reactors now. That's, uh, there's too many other factors at play right now. Yeah, I disagree. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> I think Japan, uh, from a perception level for investors, if Japan restarts reactor after reactor and we get up to, say, what did they have, 30? And now the, the, the eighth has just restarted. And I know in Cameco's view, uh, that's really important to the marketplace. So uh, I'll go with them and uh, I'll, I'll vote that Japanese reactors are important perception to the marketplace. But the really, the big thing is it's electricity demand. So where's the demand going to come from? And I think we know, yeah. don't we? No, I agree. Yep. Do, do, where's it coming from? It's coming from you and me, <laughs> yeah. I want to throw a little curveball. I'm sorry. Can we talk about underfeeding for a second? You have some detractors, let's call them, of the uranium market that say there's there's enough supply because you can underfeed. First of all, explain to a neophyte like me what underfeeding is, and then let me have your 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 take on it. Well, I'm not an expert on underfeeding, but uh, I can tell you that when what you can do is is when you are um, uh, when you are um, I'm going to lose the word here. Enriching. Enriching. When you are in the, rich, in the enrichment process, if you leave your fuel in or if you leave the product into your centrifuge longer, you can actually create more. A, more. <laughs> um, I, but I think, um, as I understand it, the, uh, uh, it's, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a trade-off. It, it's not creating a lot more um, fuel in the long It is in the short term, but I'm not going to explain this properly. I it's think, tough. I think it, it's, uh, it, it is a trade-off in terms of their capacity. So what they're doing is they're using underused capacity by doing the underfeeding. Uh, but when there is adequate product coming in, that's the more profitable way for them to produce fuel, so they stop. Um, so it, it's kind of one or the other. They're not, they're not creating a whole lot of additional inventory in the background. Right. All I know is it takes one to four years, so pick your spot <laughs> for the, the enrichment of fuel. So four years is a long time. if there's big demand, then they're going to take less time. 
If there's less demand, they'll probably take more time. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's really created so much more inventory that it, it's, it's become a problem. What it has allowed is for the enrichers to, to continue to operate profitably during, during a downtime. Can we talk about the utilities? Because we've talked about mostly everything else at this point, Russia and Japan and China build out and things. But for me, one of the most important things is for utilities to come back into the market and start contracting in a big way. Um, because it seems like they all follow each other and they really don't care how much the price is once they all start following each, following each other. And again, we go back to the question of when. What do you guys know about the utility contracting cycle and when are utilities due to come back in and start contracting? Well, I think if Dev were here from Fission, he'd, he'd whine on about the fact that he can't understand why the utilities aren't contracting the hell out of this thing right now that all the prices are low and he's right. Um, what, is, what has been interesting is that um, as, as all of these pressures on, on uh, supply have come into play over the last four, five, six months, what we've seen in terms of long-term contracts is, is absolutely no, uh, no, no transactions whatsoever mm -hmm. for the most part. Uh, the price is currently $30. It was $30 last month, the month before, et cetera. Not because people are trading it at $30. That just happened to be the last time it was uh, it was contracted. And I think what's been interesting now that all these uh, now all these uh, supply pressures are there that it's it's like crickets out there. It's a big standoff, and uh, we're waiting for to see who blinks first. The uh, the utilities are really I don't think any of them want to be the first guy to come out and set that new price that isn't $30 anymore. And uh, and I think if they were going to, to buy it at, at a discount, they've, uh, they've missed their window. Because now that the producers have taken the hit that they have, I don't think uh, they're going to be willing to uh, hand off any bargains as well. So I think the producers are in a position now to, to demand a higher price. I think the utilities just have to decide you know, when and how they're going to s sign on the dotted line and accept a new price. But they're not in a hurry. Because I, I, one of our directors was at the Madrid World nuclear fuel cycle conference in April, mid-April. According to the notes that he gave me, there's 1.79 billion pounds of uranium in inventory right now in the world. And utilities own 53% of that. So they're not in a hurry. They can do as they please right now. But if the demand for electricity comes in the next three, four, five years, electric cars, desalinization, some of these factors that really haven't been calculated yet. That's when we'll see a change. Yeah. So we have to be patient. Uh, two points I want to make on that is, for utilities, I think the, the contract price is going to have to be higher um, for a couple of reasons. One, nobody makes money at 30 or $40 uranium, nobody in the world. Um, and second of all, I think an important point is that once utilities do start buying, it's really not important to them what the price of the uranium is. And this is a point I tried to, to drive home. The, the cost for utility of building and owning uh, nuclear reactors is just that, building, owning, maintaining, decommissioning. The, the fuel, the uranium, is, is, is a minuscule part of that, that overall budget, that overall capital outlay. And so uranium-50, uranium-80, it's like they really don't care. Is that, is, that, is that fair? Very fair. No, that's absolutely the truth. I think you've heard, everybody's heard Rick Rule go on about this as well, and he's right. Um, if, you know, if, if the price of uranium doubles, it barely, barely notches the price of a kilowatt hour. So, in fact, if it does go 50, 80, 120, they'll just keep buying it. And then to Warren's point about the, the growing electricity demand, you know, we want carbon-free uh, electricity now in the modern world, things that don't emit uh, carbon, and, and uranium is one of them. In fact, it's the only form of, of electricity generation baseload power that is carbon-free. Not only carbon-free, but safe. And some people might want to have a debate about that, but per kilowatt hour of electricity generated over history, nuclear energy is the safest form of, of power the, the human race has ever seen. Fair? Your are numbers. I'm going to disagree with you. <laughs> I think they're good. I think they're good. Um, so let's turn to the basin where uh, you both all, uh, you both, you both operate, and particularly, I guess, the the west side of the basin, which is something new. So, um, both being experts in the basin, can can one or both of you give us a rudimentary history lesson on the on the development of the basin? Because as I understand it, not being a geologist, we've gone. Uh, different routes. Uh, we've gone now to the to the through the unconformity to the basement, 
and and now we're drilling deeper for uranium and also it used to be the east side of the basin was the hot spot but then fission and next gen did this thing right can you explain <laughs> you can go and then i'll come in <laughs> um yeah certainly certainly the western side of the basin has been been opened up as recently and thanks to the work of fission and and the work of next gen um we're working just north of them as i mentioned before the this entire patterson uh uranium district that we speak of is uh it's really a band of of conductors and shears that that flow up through the area uh we've measured it to be about 30 40 maybe even 50 kilometers into the basin uh, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper <clears throat> Uh, both fission and next gen's deposits are just outside of what we know as the basin, just outside of the uh, the sandstone. We're just on the inside. What's been interesting in uh, in the last few years is that we've been uh, doing a lot of drilling in that area. We have one small deposit called Spitfire that we've done a significant amount of work on, and we're now opening up another area called the Dragon Zone. And and what's been unbelievably useful, of course, is is comparing the two. And what we're seeing is that the the setting. The way the, uh, the mineralization is presenting itself, the way the alteration uh, and the solicitation is presenting itself at Dragon is identical to what we did see down at uh, Spitfire, and it's what we understand to be the same setting down at, at Triple R and down at Arrow, and hopefully what you'll see and just we're, to the north of us. We're very gratified <laughs> that Dragon is so good because you're getting closer to it's, us it's with coming. every drill hole. We love this. But it is, it this. is definitely different than what we're used to seeing on the east side of the basin, where uh, the, the unconformity deposits are, are it's a different setting. We're more into basement hosted deposits now on this side of the basin. And we have another project called Smart Lake, which is further to the west, um, that we were, uh, we were quite successful in a few years ago. We moved our efforts over to Patterson Lake. But now that we've done the work that we have at Patterson Lake, we recognize what we were seeing over at Smart Lake. And it's identical as well. The settings are all very similar, very common, but they are very different from what we were used to seeing on the east side. And one thing I can say about the east side, Cameco found, as SMDC, MacArthur River, arguably the greatest uranium deposit ever found in excess of 600 million pounds at 20%. Uh, it's just a fantastic deposit. They took that knowledge, they came over to the southwest, to Hook Lake, right. your project, and they saw things that they called P2. And I see it in their reports. P2 is the main zone at MacArthur River. They see the same characteristics in the Hook and the Patterson Lake trend, the Hook Lake property, the Hook Carter right, property. Right. So it was them that kept that alive. But I think to a point I've heard you make many times, and you're right, is that the, the model of the day back on the east side was to drill down to the unconformity, maybe 20, 30 meters below that. That's where you were looking for your deposits. What we're seeing is that the mineralization doesn't even start until you get down around 40, 50, 60 meters below the unconformity. So a lot of the drilling that was done on the west uh, down where we are and in that entire area was all stopping short. They were, they were stopping the drill just when they were starting to hit what we would consider good stuff. There were some famous near misses back in the day. Absolutely. 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 One chemical, what they did see was alteration on the Hook Lake corridor. And I, re I see reports going back to say 2000 when they think there's something really big here. We just don't know where it is yet. And so what do we find? We find Triple R. Now Arrow and all these deposits, now Chris's deposits, and now Denison's drilling on our property. So this is just beginning, really. But the, but the, work, the work goes back decades. So, you know, they're uh, Cameco, Arriva, um, Uringa Cell Shaft, all were working in that area decades ago and, and seeing Uringa Cell Shaft three more times. And, uh, you know, they, they picked up a lot of the sampling uh, that, that we're following up on today. It was all there, and that's why they hung on to those projects. So what I'm sensing is that it's elephant country. You mentioned Triple R, Patterson Lake, 100 million pounds, likely much more still to come. Arrow, 200 million pounds. 300 million pounds. Do you think there's, are there more giants, I guess is the question, and maybe you already answered it. Nah. Well, <laughs> I, I, like, I like Denison as a partner because they think that as, they, as we go up the Northeast trend that the deposits could become even richer. Wow. So I like people that say things like that. Sure. You know, I, I, I definitely think there's a lot of room for, for some more big deposits, mainly because the ones we found so, so far are huge. There's too, there's too many big deposits in the basin right now. There's McCarthy, you say, but there's Cigar, there's Triple R at 300 pound, million pounds each. There's, you've, got, you've got Key Lake at 150, you've got Triple R at 150. So, I mean, these are, they're all too big. 
typically in any region of the world, you may find this massive uh, copper deposit with a bunch of really good other deposits in the area. There's too many big ones here. Well, I don't think we've found the big one yet. We're going to need a mill, that's for sure. That's right. Well, now it might be a mile down in the middle of the basin, for all we know, but I think there's, I think there's a bigger one out there. Yeah, the trick is, how, what's your depth of investigation? So if you're, like Triple R was found at 60 meters, the first drill hole that hit mineralization. That was shocking oh, because yeah. it was so shallow and so rich. So now here we are, we're going deeper. And it had always been there. <laughs> Nobody's seen. Well, the, the Orano guy says, yeah, we used to drive by there like, you know, twice a week yeah. you know, on the road to Clough Lake. <laughs> but, you know, certainly it's not practical to drill thousand meter holes at, in searching. I mean, once Next Gen found Arrow, then they just started following things and that's different. That's more practical. Went deeper, yep. And and uh, you know, I mean, the proof's in the pudding. We've we've certainly the likes of Cameco, Arano, Denison are not spending millions and millions of dollars in that area without uh, without believing that there's the opportunity to find a tier one deposit. They don't they don't waste their time. So back to the macro, and then I'll let you wrap up on your projects because we have four minutes left. Crystal Ball, 18, 24 months out. What's uranium look like, both of you? I'd like to see it at minimum of sure. $25 on the spot price and, and an excess of 40 for long term. Do you know, what, you know the long term. What is it today? Well, right now the long term is $30 and it has been for, for, for months now. Um, I think, you know, I think, and I go back to the coiled spring analogy that I've heard a few people mention, I think this, this pent up deer in the headlights kind of waiting that's going on with the contracts is, is going to, somebody, somebody's going to blink. And I think at that point we're going to see, see a jump. We've historically, Every time uranium's come back, it's come back with a ridiculous vengeance. And, uh, and I don't see anything, any reason why it, it may not do that again. Um, you know, definitely over the next two years, it's got to go back up to 50, 60, 70 dollars. It just, it has to. I'd like, I, I'd like to believe, my, it's my thinking as we look at some of the numbers coming out that we're going to see that jump happen sometime in the next six months. Okay, I'll go with that. <laughs> And before I get back to your companies, explain to the audience what that means for, for uranium-related equities. Um, maybe some people weren't around for the Cigar Lake flood or in 2007, but what happens when the, when the uranium price starts to go up? What happens to uranium equities, especially for 10, 20 million market cap companies? Well, it explodes. I, I was part of UX Corporation back in 2004. All of a sudden, things started. Nobody wanted us. That's right. And so, then all of a sudden, like the now. price... Sort of like now? Uh, yeah, well, that's it. Warren Buffett says buy stocks when nobody wants you them. You can tell by the exp extensive panel they've assembled here today. <laughs> when it goes, it goes fast. So, you know, I saw uranium go from $15, $20 to 100 Now, that was accentuated by people speculating in the marketplace. If that comes back again, then watch out. Sure. Then we could be at $70, $80 uranium. You know, I think... Uh, Right now, if you, if you look, there are less than 20 uh, public uranium exploration companies on the planet. And less than 10 producers, I think, or something like that. And there's, there's less than 10 producers, and there's less than 20 developers. Um, the sheer demand for our stock is going to drive. <laughs> there's, 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 just, there, there's not a lot left. I mean, there's only a few left standing, and I think you have to look at all of them, and they'll, we will certainly all rise with the tide. But I think the ones that, that remain, that are, that are still around, the, the ALXs, the Pier Points, and the others of the world, are here for a reason. We've got uh, projects that were worth hanging on to through the downtime. Um, we've been able to find support uh, where others haven't through this downtime, and we've been able to keep ourselves uh, busy in moving these projects along. So I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity right across the board. And historically, as you say, whenever, you know, if, if the uranium price doubles, we quadruple. Two minutes left, a minute each. Recap your projects, your companies, your tickers, and your booths. ALX Uranium, uh, we trade on the Canadian TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol AL. We're at booth 210. We can show you the evolution of the uranium deposit model for the Athabasca Basin there and fully explain it, how things have changed from 1970 till now. And yes, we are going and looking for deeper basement hosted deposits because in our opinion, many times uranium was found at the unconformity, that's where the sandstone and the basement rocks meet. And not enough drilling was done. If they didn't find a deposit there, they would stop. So. That's our opportunity now. 
We have projects on the edges of the basin from the northeast down along the eastern side, uh, a little bit around Key Lake, uh, which produced over 200 million pounds in a shallow environment. We're looking in the shallow environments. We're going back to uh, flying radiometric surveys, which we're about to begin on some of our new properties. Uh, what we were looking for is buried uranium boulders like the ones that found Patterson Lake. And that's the old time way of doing it. The difference is they're not sitting on surface. They're under here and you have to go, you need powerful equipment to find them. Men with scintillometers can't find them the same way a plane can that flies low. So we're going back to basics and we hope to find new deposits. And thank you. Chris. Uh, again, it's Pure Point Uranium Group, Inc. Uh, we trade on the uh, Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol PTU. We have 10 projects in Saskatchewan. Eight of them are 100% owned. Uh, uh, one is uh, Smart Lake, which uh, is a partnership with Cameco. And the, our project that we spend the most of our time and effort on these days is Hook Lake in the Patterson Uranium District. Uh, we just completed a $4 million drill program uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we're probably uh, the largest uh, uranium exploration project going for the last few years out there, um, uh, dollar-wise, and we're, we're uh, following up on the same sort of um, indicators and results and discoveries that, uh, that, that launched uh, Arrow and, uh, and Triple R. So we're, we're excited to be out there. We'll be out there for a while, and for the next day or two, we'll be over there. Um, I'm not sure what our booth number is, but... Uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll find us. Thank you. Chris Warren, thanks a lot. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Thank you.